Hi folks. So I'm, I'm a clinical neurologist by training. And so it kind of goes with the, uh, with the job description that I've seen lots of folks suffer disease and you know, often die uh, who, who didn't deserve it. Uh, but long before I became a physician, um, I saw my first example of that. And let's see. What you're looking at is uh, my high school friends. And that was in 74. Well, 45 years later, people did pretty well. She became a nurse, he a dentist, he a rabbi of all things, a uh, businessman. This guy got the cigarette out of his mouth and became a neurologist. <laughs> this fellow didn't fare as well. About five years after this was taken, he died on train tracks running away from imaginary persecutors. Basically, he developed paranoid schizophrenia and over a couple of year period deteriorated to the point where none of us recognized him. And so early in the game, I became fascinated with the idea, even in the setting of this tragedy, of how could we fix the brain? You know, how, how, how can we not just treat people, but actually really get to the core of it? And, and fix underlying problems? Could we replace the cells that form the basis for brain disease? And in cases of injury or trauma, could, could we essentially repair damage that, that has occurred? And so, you know, one lesson in medicine is if you want to do something that's new before you start, look to nature and see if it's already being done on some level. And in fact, it was already being done. Um, so this, this is a, a canary, songbird. And that is what a canary sounds like. Um, what, what's remarkable though, every trill that this bird is singing, you know, as it changes from one set of elements in the song to another, those are represented by new neurons that are being generated in this bird's brain. A songbird learns a new song every year. And as it does so, it's laying down new neurons that actually replace the neurons from the year before. And so it's actually a, an awfully interesting example of cell replacement in the nervous system. And so I studied it for quite a number of years and basically learned the rules by which cells could be replaced in, in the nervous system. So it turned out that there were populations of, uh, of neural stem cells in these brains essentially provide the, the basis for, uh, for these new neurons. That the, the, these cells are constantly being generated in the bird's brain and basically during the periods that the bird's learning a new song, it, 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 uh, it, it signals these neurons to survive and integrate into existing brain networks. So we ask the question whether or not these kinds of progenitor cells, these neural stem cells that can produce new, new brain cells, whether they persist in the mammalian brain as well. And, and as the case may be in the human brain. A number of groups got involved in this over about a decade, looking at different species, looking at uh, basically through phylogeny, through evolution, to see where these progenitors might exist and what species. And well, it turns out that we all have them. Uh, all, all, all mammals, all vertebrates retain progenitor populations in the adult brain that can generate new brain cells. In humans, though, not too many of these cells become neurons. In fact, it's still controversial how many. But there are large populations of these glial progenitor cells. So in the brain, we have neurons, the electrically excitable cells that connect up to each other and really form the, the basis for neural activity. But we also have glial cells, which are the support cells of the brain. And they are, they're actually the majority of the cells in the brain are these support cells. And they fall into two basic categories, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are the cell type that makes myelin, the white matter of the brain, that allows conduction from one area to another. Astrocytes are the support cell that, that directly provides nutrition, metabolic support to neurons. But more than that, astrocytes actually control the synaptic activity of neurons. And so in many ways, it's, astrocytes are calling the shots in terms of the coordination of impulses within neural networks. And so it turns out that we have an awful, awful lot of glial progenitor cells in our brains. About 5% of all of our cells are glial progenitors. And the majority, the most abundant cell type in the nervous system is the astrocyte.
just hasn't gotten quite as much credit as the neurons because the tools haven't been there for investigating in, until recent. So we thought, gee whiz, if we have progenitors just like canaries, but most of what they're doing is giving rise to these glial progenitors, then what can these cells do? And so we transplanted them. And we actually went into baby mice and transplanted the cells. Asked the question, what can they become? Well, the big surprise was that they, they move all over the place. So these glial progenitors are, it's a really active cell population. They can migrate, they divide. And in the mouse brain, and this is a, a mouse that's been allowed to grow up after a, a, a neonatal injection of the cells. Well, in the mouse brain, the cells take over. And every red dot here is a human cell. And when you look at so many of these, you say, well, gee whiz, you know, where are the mouse cells? And, and the answer to that is there aren't any. The, the human cells take over. At least the progenitor cells do. And so here we're looking at four, eight, 12 months after injection of these cells, of, of human glial progenitor cells into the mouse. And the red cells are mouse, the green cells are human. And you can see over time, the human cells take over. By the time you're a year out, there are no mouse progenitors left in these brains. They're all, all human. So that has implications. Remember, it's, the, the neurons are still mouse, right? It, it's the glial progenitor population and network that's, that's starting to take over. And so this is what the cells look like. These are human cells in the mouse brain. And we get the sense of just, just how dense, densely packed these cells are, how they communicate with each other through all these fibers. But the importance is that over time, you know, these are progenitors. They can give rise, as I mentioned, to astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. Well, they keep giving rise to more and more astrocytes. And so, because astrocytes are normally turning over in the brain. In other words, we're constantly losing astrocytes and they're being replaced by new astrocytes from the progenitor. But now all these astrocytes that are being generated are human astrocytes. So we, end, whoops, so we end up with these brains where most of the astrocytes in the white matter, many in the gray matter, as well as all the progenitors are human. So what does that start to do to a brain, right? And, and why does it matter? So it matters because human astrocytes are really complex. They're large, they have lots of fibers, as when we'll see other examples of this. And these fibers, at the end of every fiber, and you can't really tell in this stain, but these break up into hundreds of fibers individually, every one of these. At the end of every one, they're encompassing, they're sheathing a synapse. And synapse, of course, is where one neuron connects up with the other, and it's how signals are transmitted in the, in the nervous system. Well, all the, these astrocytes, their fibers, are sheathing these synapses, and they're segregating them one from the next from the next. And that allows the, essentially the astrocyte to control all of the synapses within its domain, setting the firing threshold. So it's coordinating neural network activity across the brain. Well, that's fine, but then this is what a mouse astrocyte looks like. Just a handful of fibers, not nearly uh, as many, the much smaller cell. And the bottom line is that a, a mouse astrocyte might only be controlling the actions of a couple hundred to a thousand synapses, a human astrocyte may be controlling 10,000 to 100,000, maybe more. So these human astrocytes have much greater capability of coordinating neural activity than mouse. And yet now we have mouse brains where the cells are by and large human, right? So, so what does that do to the activity in these networks. It's not just that the cells are larger, the human cells larger and have more fibers, but they also send projections really widely throughout the nervous systems. And so you can see these really bushy human cells, roughly globular in shape, but besides the many synapses that they're controlling within their domains, they're sending these long fibers out to other parts of the brain, essentially coordinating activity across brain regions, which is not done in, in the mice in a normal mouse. And so what does that do to, to these animals? Well, it actually makes them smarter, right? And, and, and uh, uh, you know, this, this was a, a surprise, but, um, but it was very logical given, given the, you know, the, the data at hand. And so we asked, asked the question, do these animals behave differently cognitively? And this is just one, one example. So the point here is that the transplanted mouse, which, which is the animal on the right, these mice were exposed to a shock and a sound the day before that. First the sound, then the shock. And then the following day, we asked the question, does one mouse pick up that association better than the other? And it, and it turns out 
that the mice who uh, have been transplanted actually make that association much more rapidly. And, uh, and because of that, uh, we, we could judge that they are making, uh, essentially they're learning more rapidly. They're making associations between events be better than and more rapidly than untransplanted animals. So well, there's a broad variety of tests that we've gone through to, to establish that point. But across the board, these animals actually learn more rapidly across a variety of modalities. So if, 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 the, if the human astrocyte can essentially transmit, I won't say transmit uh, cognitive capability, but transmit the ability to, to integrate neural networks better, more effectively than, than astrocytes of lower species, then what does that have, you know, what does that tell us about uh, what happens when astrocytes go wrong? So we can actually make these glial cells from stem cells. And so we can take tissue samples uh, of, of any one of us and make stem cells using reprogramming strategies that were developed about a decade ago, make pluripotent stem cells that can make essentially any cell type of the body, and we can make gliopogenitors from those. So we've done that from schizophrenic patients and also from normals, and then compared how these behave after transplantation into animals. And the, the question being, can we pick up some, some aspects of a schizophrenic phenotype? In other words, some, some evidence of abnormal behavior that accrues to the astrocyte, that accrues to the, the astrocytes generated from schizophrenic patients. And you know, why do we ask that question? Be because, you know, Glial cells evolve, essentially, th and have evolved through mammalian, de uh, mammalian evolution, mammalian development, so that in lower species, until you get to primates, they're very simple. Astrocytes suddenly become larger, more bushy when you get to primates, but it's only at the great apes and the level of the humans that they really take off in terms of morphology, in terms of their complexity. And so with that complexity comes risk. Because what happens if something goes wrong? Well, one of the things that uh, really characterizes schizophrenia, bipolar disease, autism, the neuropsychiatric illnesses, is that these are really diseases of humans, right? Some of the primatologists would say that apes have, uh, uh, have some aspects of schizophrenic phenotype in some cases. But, but below the level of the great apes and humans, there's no evidence of any of these types of neuropsychiatric diseases. So maybe the, the evolution of psychiatric disease tracked essentially astrocytic evolution. So as glia became more involved in coordinating our neural activity, as glia became more involved in dictating essentially cognition and intelligence, maybe as, as the complexity increased and things started to go wrong potentially, that that uh, essentially allowed psychiatric diseases to emerge. And so we asked that question by taking these stem cells, taking them from schizophrenic patients and normals, and then making, making gliopogenitors, putting them into to mice, and then seeing what the cells became. And this, this really gives you a pretty good idea. You hear normal human astrocytes, they look very similar to what we saw before, that uh, have been generated in these mouse brains after injection neonatally of the, of the human gliopogenitors. And yet here we're looking at progenitors taken from schizophrenic patients, at least from their, from their derived stem cells. And we see how abnormal these cells are. They're clearly misshapen. They don't have the globular structure. They don't have domains. And so, so what that means is that you've got a lot of open areas that, where the synapses aren't covered. Yeah, they're, they're uncontrolled. And that, that allows the, the, the system to really be dysregulated so, so that uh, effectively <coughs> neural networks within the region can't communicate to, to one another in an organized fashion play that out over the size of an entire brain and, and you're left with chaos and, and, and there's nothing as chaotic as, as a schizophrenic brain. This is what it looks like on the single cell level. The, the globular shape of a normal astrocyte, the, this, this strange misshapen set shape of a schizophrenic. We have a pretty good idea, by the way, of the molecular basis for this now and, and, and that's, that's prompting a lot of work on the therapeutic side. But the bottom line is these cells are really abnormal and you've got large regions that simply aren't covered within what we call the neuropil, the area where the synapses are. And so that allows essentially the, the neural, neural activity to go onto autopilot. It's, it's not under coordinated control.
So what does that do to the animals? Well, in fact, as you might expect, their, their behavior is, is, is abnormal. Uh, so these, these are animals now that, in some le levels and by some measures, they're smarter. They're, their brains are pervaded by human cells, but, the, but their actual behavior is abnormal. And with, without going into too much detail, they're, they're anxious, uh, they're, uh, they're asocial, they avoid one another, they're fearful. And, and so in many ways, you know, I don't want to anthropomorphize it too much to say that they're, they're showing uh, evidence of schizophrenic-like behaviors, but they're clearly abnormal behaviorally. So the human astrocytes have transmitted not only increased cognitive capabilities, increased intelligence, if you will, but they've also transmitted a psychiatric disease, or at least a, aspects of a disease phenotype. And so, you know, that, that, that leads us to a couple of conclusions here. So for first and foremost, that, that human glial cells uh, are really, really special. It, it, they are what make us special. They are, they are what uh, essentially make us human. Um, they, they provide effectively uh, complexity to, to our brains and, and allow a degree of, of communication among brain regions that is unparalleled in, uh, in, in animal development otherwise. And yet with that increased complexity, again, comes risk, right? and, and basically comes the potential for, for disease, for psychiatric disease. And so at the same time, we've also shown the, the potential for cell replacement. So what if we can replace these cells outright, replace sick cells with healthy cells, and correct these glial-borne, these glial-carried disorders? And so you know, there are a number of diseases that, that we're looking at now. So it's not as far-fetched as, as, as it seems. The critical question becomes what if we can, can essentially fix, not just treat symptomatically, but actually fix brain disease. And in cases like schizophrenia, uh, do we want to? That's a, that becomes a very provocative issue there. If, if we have a, a patient who's, who's developing a psychiatric disorder, we treat with glioprogenitor cells, and that patient improves. Well, they may not have the same personality they started out with, right? And, and so these are all questions for the future. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.